My topic is uh, whether deglobalization is on the way. Not a totally unrelated topic to Brexit, I must say, but still a much wider angle, which will be uh, the substance of these uh, few remarks before we go to Q&A. And I have no doubt that when we are back to Q&A, uh, Brexit will come back to haunt us. Now, my uh, starting point uh, is uh, that uh, there are symptoms of uh, deglobalization. My second observation will be that yet uh, I do not believe uh, deglobalization will happen. And my third and last point would be that uh, even if globalization goes forward, which I think it will, this does not mean uh, that uh, we it is without serious uh, challenges. We have a few symptoms of deglobalization, uh, both on the uh, economic side and on the uh, side of politics. On the economics, uh, we know that the trade to GNP ratio, uh, which had been growing uh, for the last decade has uh, been reduced from 1 to 2, 1 to 3, even 1 to 3.5 in some periods to something which is more 1 to 1.5. We know that uh, the financial crisis has uh, led to a deglobalization of finance and of the finance industry uh, as risks is more properly weighted. Uh, financial institutions take less risks, and, uh, and when they take less risks, uh, they interact uh, with people, systems, companies, they know more, and you always know more about your proximity than at distance. So this has led to a shrinking of uh, trade flows. Uh, to some extent of investment flows, and certainly to uh, trade finance flows, uh, which for obscure reasons had been considered as uh, risky by the Basel Committee, and it took me a few years when I was DG of WTO to convince these people that trade finance was a reasonably, reasonably safe activity. There are also views or signals that uh, with uh, 3D printing, with uh, artificial intelligence, uh, you could relocalize, repatriate uh, production processes which had been uh, sent away. So there's a series of signals of this kind. And of course, we also have these uh, political signals, which are uh, in some cases uh, loud and clear. Uh, that enough uh, with uh, globalization, uh, maybe uh, this benefits others, but not me. All the people who, whom I live, uh, hence this sort of uh, protectionist, uh, isolationist, uh, identity-based uh, pulsions and surges, uh, the election of Trump, uh, movements in uh, Europe and US uh, who are now uh, pushing uh, for uh, uh, America first, or my country first, and to some extent Brexit is probably a part of that, although, and I'll come back to that in a minute, uh, the answer of Brexit being that uh, Britain wants to be global is something of a paradox in this uh, situation. So we have symptoms of either some reality of deglobalization or some desire of deglobalization, which finds a, a political expression, and by the way, not only in US or EU, uh, uh, Turkey, uh, Philippines, uh, Russia, uh, are also good examples of that. Now, does this mean uh, deglobalization is underway? No. I don't believe uh, it will happen. I don't believe it will happen, uh, A, because uh, Economics are now organized in such a way uh, 
that the cost of deglobalization are higher than ever, and probably too high, in my view, uh, for deglobalization to happen. And second, because in the politics, because of this e resistance of economics to politics, in most circumstances, the political appeal to deglobalization will remain uh, more bar than bite. On the economic side, and I've seen that for a few decades, uh, the numbers that appear and which point in the direction of deglobalization are doubtful. And notably, this famous trade to GNP ratio, uh, which is a ratio between peers and apples, uh, trade uh, measured in volumes, and GNPs uh, measured in value addition, uh, which uh, serious economists would say makes no sense. The more globalization expands, the more the multi-localization of production processes leading to an intensification of the volume of trade happens, the more this ratio between uh, volumes of trade and GNP increases. And it sometimes increases rapidly, sometimes increases more slowly. What matters if you want to look at the reality of globalization is not to measure trade in volumes, but to measure trade in value addition, the same way as you do it with GNP. And there are statistical methods to do that, simply. They're not the same as the ones that you use to filter production uh, statistics into uh, GNP. And if you look at trade measured in added value, then the picture of the evolution of trade and globalization is very different. And this is correlated by the fact that the import content of exports keeps growing, but for a very specific case, uh, which is uh, China. So if you look at serious economics, serious numbers, nothing like a prospect or even a reality you could measure of deglobalization, the only thing that appears is some slowdown of the speed of globalization, because in some areas, the expansion of value chains is not eternally <laughs> yielding positive results. At some stage, you reach the efficiencies which uh, you wanted to reach, and you have to wait for a change of relative prices to move to another set of efficiencies. If you look at an area which we don't measure well, uh, but which is getting more and more important in globalization, which is data, the flow of data, which is uh, circulating worldwide and international, uh, is uh, rising exponentially. Uh, the data globalization offsets in terms of its importance from far the bit of financial deglobalization uh, which I uh, mentioned uh, before. The reality being that these global value chains, which is the way the economy, the modern economy now works, whether goods or services, are there to stay and even progress further as technology uh, keeps cutting uh, the cost of distance, uh, which is the only factor, uh, the evolution of which uh, both Mr. Ricardo and Mr. Schumpeter uh, could not dream of. They produced their theories, and I'll come back to that in a minute, in a technological context where the main obstacle to trade would always remain distance. And they explain why other factors, like comparative advantage, like competitive shocks, destructive creation, and so on, would overhaul production systems, but their view was that this was within a situation where distance would remain a big obstacle to international division of labor. Now, this has totally changed. Every day brings something that crushes a bit more the cost of distance, whether for goods, which have to be transported, or 
for services which have to be transported, which is information. And I'll take, not to be too abstract, not to be too Cartesian, I'll take two examples of that in last week's news. In France, which remains my uh, main country of residence, although I spend most of my time elsewhere, we have a problem, we've had a problem last week, which is that butter has disappeared from a number of supermarket shelves. No butter. Mm. Big thing in the press. Bit more in the north than in the south. No butter on supermarket shelves. What, what's going on? You know, we have a globalized market capitalist society, and these guys are not even able to provide butter. And of course, the moment the rumor that there won't be butter, whoop, everybody jumps on butter, and of course, there is less butter the next day. Now, the reality is that the butter production, uh, which you in Ireland know very well, uh, it's not just producing butter. It's, uh, it's very complex. You have a, need a cow, you need milk. Uh, you need to feed the cow in such a way that it produces milk, which is more or less fat content. And sometimes you need a cow that produces a lot of fat milk, but sometimes less fat. So you change a bit of the genetics of the cow, but also the feeding of the cow. And then the Chinese suddenly decide there is a bit of regulation. And the next week, New Zealand, whoop, butter and milk goes to China. And if it goes to China, it doesn't go to Europe. And if you dig in the reasons why, there suddenly is a lack of butter in supermarkets in front, it has to do with global supply chains. Somebody has done something that has ruptured the rationality of the system, that has changed relative prices, and I'd better send my milk to China rather than next door. Another example of this kind, which I think is also telling, is this, uh, and you know that in Ireland because it's a sensitive issue here, this famous uh, anti-subsidy tariff which Bombardier, uh, which Trump, uh, who, I want tariffs, I want tariffs, I want tariffs, he got a tariff, they brought him a dead animal, which is what he wants, which is a tariff. He got it, and then he put uh, an anti-dumping tariff on Bombardier, uh, the problem being, according to him, that Bombardier benefits from subsidies. I don't know any airplane producing uh, system in the planet that doesn't benefit from subsidies, including Boeing and Airbus, and I had some reason to be acquainted with this story for a long time. So, anti-subsidy on Bombardier, and a fortnight after, Bombardier says it's a mid-range body uh, production to Airbus, which I'm convinced is not exactly what Boeing was after in pushing for an anti-dumping duty on Bombardier. Nor did probably Trump know that in putting his tariff, he would create this chain reaction which lead to a sort of big bonus coming from the sky, which I think the people in Airbus would never have imagined this would happen. But it happens because there are value chains, there are relative prices, all this is totally interconnected. So that's the way it works, which is why I believe that the economics of globalization will resist attempts to deglobalize. Uh, probably, and to put it simply, and maybe too simply, because we've reached a stage of globalization which makes deglobalization too costly. Now, does this mean that there will be no bombs? Of course not. It simply is a recognition that the cost of deglobalization are a limiting factor to other elements which may push in this direction, which bring me uh, to my third and uh, last point. Of course, this doesn't mean that uh, globalization will keep uh, moving uh, forward nicely, freely, like uh, 
like uh, the Rhine, uh, according to uh, Helmut Kohl, who used to say, you know, when he was sitting in his office in Bonn with the Rhine, you know, the Rhine is flowing and that's the European history flowing. No, there will be bombs, there will be turbulences, for one simple reason, which we know already, but which we have to know will not be suddenly offset in the times to come, uh, which is that globalization works uh, because it's painful, and it's painful because it works. And this is, by the way, what Mr. Ricardo and Mr. Schumpeter told us at the time when they wrote their theories. If you take them hand in hand together, not separately, they explain together why it works and why it is painful and why it works because it's painful and it's painful because it works. It creates efficiencies, which is what economic growth is about. Economic growth is a sum of increased efficiencies plus some uh, movements in uh, factors of production to the cost of reshuffling production systems, which become more efficient because the allocation of production factors becomes more efficient. Nothing more to say about this. I recognize it's a bit of a global theory, but that's roughly how it works. And of course, this pain-gain equation, which is there, uh, has a political, human, social consequences. It raises, understandably, and if anybody thought it wasn't the case, <laughs> they were wrong. I wrote that in a book which I published when I left WTO. The day I recovered my freedom of speech, which is called the Geneva Consensus, which is the explanation of why trade works for the benefit of all under a series of conditions. And negating these conditions or pretending globalization, the intensification of international exchange brings benefits to everybody is just nonsense. And I must recognize that some of them, not of us, but some of them sometimes erred in this direction. The reality is that, yes, it is globally efficient, uh, but it is locally uneven and that this distribution, the pain-gain distribution, uh, remains a huge problem. Uh, globalization is not, per se, a fair process. It is an unfair process, because the distribution of pain and gains is, as could be expected by good sense, uh, better for uh, the big, uh, the rich, uh, than for the small and the poor. Even if, even if we've seen a formidable reduction in poverty thanks to the expansion of international exchange, we've also seen, and that has to be recognized, a very important increase of uh, inequalities. Now, what's the way forward? And that's my final point. Recognizing these uneven Yes, this unfair, intrinsically unfair nature of the system and address or try to address the unfairness issues both globally and locally. Addressing them globally is about roughly uh, rules, rules on trade, rules on environment, uh, rules on health, rules on social, uh, rules on whatever, animal welfare, if uh, this can be done, uh, which creates a more level playing field so that this notion that between countries the game is unfair uh, is, uh, is addressed. We know what to do. We also know that uh, diplomats uh, sometimes have a problem doing it, uh, which is why the solution is to get rid of diplomats as much as possible and uh, do it in a way that works, although states would not agree. And this is the road to what I call the polygovernance as opposed to multi-governance, which is engaging in this global 
harnessing globalization, uh, not only states, uh, but non-sovereign entities <coughs> like cities, for instance, if you look at environment or HIV AIDS, mega cities on this planet have probably been playing a bigger role in addressing more this problem than many sovereigns. Engaging civil society organizations, many of these organizations are globally powerful and much more powerful than many members of the UN General Assembly and of course business because we know for sure that a number of multinationals have a bigger say on where the world is going than, again, uh, many uh, diplomats from uh, many countries. And this is probably the way to go, although it's a bit more messy than the notion that you have a temple uh, with chapels for everybody and, uh, uh, and a clear geometry. And of course, the main issue about addressing this fairness issue is not the global one, there is a global dimension, an organization like the WTO, the ILO, the WHO, the IUT have their role uh, to play, and more to come, hopefully. But the real way to address this fairness issue has a name, which we know in politics, which is called solidarity, uh, which is a redistribution of, uh, of wealth, of money, uh, whether taxation, whether through primary revenues or secondary revenues. And it has a name which is welfare. The problem being, of course, that welfare being about solidarity uh, is inevitably local. Huh? Because solidarity only works if there is a sort of feeling of belonging that it's in your interest to have a better distribution, otherwise, your own situation will be harmed. And this is only doable within a mental universe, which is my proximity. And this is uh, the way we have to go to address this uh, Ricardo uh, Schumpeterian uh, equation. And we know that the way we've done it, at least in the Western world, uh, since the 19th century, which probably was the first big shock of globalization that led to a political reaction that led to the creation of welfare states, either by uh, uh, beverage-like or Bismarck-like. Uh, beverage-like because for moral reasons, uh, Bismarck-like because for cynical reasons. That, you know, you thought that some say that mm -mm, if Ricardo Schumpeter were too uh, powerful, uh, he would be ousted or hung at the street lamp, so he decided mm -mm, we'd better look at that. And this is what led to this welfare cushion, which historically is the interpretation of how modern capitalism expanded while not crea creating a revolution, which in theory it should have created given the pain impact of the system. Now, we have to understand that understand that the way we've done it until now needs to change for a variety of reasons, notably digitalization, uh, the future of work, intelligence, artificial intelligence, the impact on qualification, the impact on mobility, the impact, I mean, the whole net system of economic, social, and cultural insecurity, which needs to be addressed. I mean, social security in a, in, in a global sense, was about reducing social insecurity. The problem we have with the globalization, which will keep going on, is the force and the speed of this process necessitates better ways of reducing the economic, social, and cultural insecurity that come from that. And this is more and more true everywhere. Of course, it's more sensitive in Europe, in US. This is why. Uh, Donald Trump uh, was uh, elected. What's exactly the proportion of economic, social, and cultural insecurity is a matter of huge debate in the US. Uh, some say one third, two thirds, others say half, half, others say three quarters, one quarter. It's, it's a fascinating debate in intellectual terms, but this is the thing we have to do. And, uh, and we Europeans, which, I mean, if you look at Europe seen from the moon, 
the difference between us and others is that we spend half of the expenditure, worldwide expenditure on social security. Uh, the identity of Europe, as compared to the rest of the world, is less uh, tolerance to inequalities uh, than elsewhere, a higher disposition to address these winner losers, although, although obviously not enough for movements like the ones we've seen uh, growing in recent times, whether on the extreme right, and that's where the big rise was, or on the extreme left, which is still there, but not with the sort of rise which we've had on the extreme right, we have to address this problem. And that's, in my view, the next question, and this is where we go back to Europe, which we do and we should do at the end of uh, all these discussions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.